May, may I quote Stephen Fry when, when somebody... <laughs> You're offended? So fucking what? <laughs> The scientific ideal is that fiddling your figures, cheating, is the worst thing you can possibly do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's true that there are individual bad apples who do it, and as Lawrence says, they're usually found out. But science is the one profession where everybody knows that if people fiddle their figures, the whole of science will simply crumble. There's no point in doing science if you fiddle your figures. Other professions like being a lawyer, for example, you're paid <laughs> to... You're paid to deceive. You're, you're paid to mislead a, a, ju a jury. I mean, even if you believe somebody is actually guilty, you're paid um, to, uh, to argue for their, for their innocence. That's uh, inconceivable to a, to, a, to a scientist. Here, I think, we come to perhaps the most powerful evidence of all for evolution, looking at the enormous numbers of modern species that there are, and comparing them systematically. Darwin was able to do this with anatomy, skeletons, for example. He was able to see that the hand of a man and the wing of a bat are directly homologous. A bat's wing is enormously long, splayed out fingers with webbing stretched between the fingers. A horse's hoof is the same hand where, of the five fingers, only the middle one remains, and the horse walks on the middle finger and the middle toe and the hoof is the, is the nail. And you can see that, you can see it in the fossil record, how the number of fingers di diminished, and there are occasional freak horses uh, which are born with three toes, showing an intermediate uh, stage. But that was the, the limit of what was possible in, in, in Darwin's time. You could compare anatomy and show very, very convincingly that it fell on a family tree. Nowadays, you can do the same thing with molecules. With, with, with genes molecularly analyzed. Because the genetic code is universal, all creatures have the same machine code, the same code whereby triplets of DNA are rendered into amino acids. You can directly compare the same gene in one animal with the same gene in another animal. You know it's the same gene. It's got essentially the same sequence with minor differences. There's a letter different here, a letter different there, a letter different there. And the corresponding differences appear in the amino acids and in the protein chain that they produce. But you can say this is the same gene, it's doing the same job, it's got the same sequence with these minor differences. And then you can ca literally count the number of differences between these genes. It's not a case of saying, oh, this limb looks a bit like that limb. You are literally comparing alternative texts, just like alternative versions of, of the book of Isaiah or something, where you just look at, count the number of differences that there are between chapters, between letters, between sentences, words. And when you do that, for any one gene you like, you find that the differences fall on a beautiful hierarchical tree. What could that be but a family tree? What could that be but a pedigree? Then you do the same thing for another gene, and you find the same tree. And then you do it for another gene, and you find the same tree. Then you do it for a gene which no longer does anything, but you can still sequence it. Nature doesn't read the gene anymore. It's never translated into protein. But molecular geneticists can read it, and they can recognize uh, that it is a defunct version of the same gene. And again, when you compare these pseudogenes, you find the same family tree. There are minor exceptions to that. But in general, it's, it's dramatically true that if you look at different genes, you find they fall on the same tree. What could that tree be but a family tree? The only alternative is that the intelligent designer, the, the creator, deliberately set out to, to, to deceive us and make it look as though evolution had happened when it didn't. That's not a resort that I think many theists would wish to cling to. Um, we are incredibly social animals, as I said before. And, and when somebody does you a good turn, it's important to be grateful. You, it's important to pay back the favor and to express your gratitude. And that, I suggest, might generalize the psychological predisp predisposition to feel grateful when something good happens to you. 
might generalize from feeling grateful when a person does something good for you and when the weather does, say, uh, when, um, a, when, a, when an accident happens, when there's an earthquake and your child doesn't die, you feel grateful. And you feel the need to, to be grateful to something or somebody. And, that, and you can't feel grateful to other people because they're not responsible for the weather. So you, so you conjure up a fictitious person to feel uh, grateful to. And that's a special case, really, of the idea that it's good survival practice to suspect agents in nature. A lot of what happens in nature doesn't have an agent deliberately causing it. A lot of it is the weather, a lot of it is the wind, um, a lot of it is just plain accidents that, that happen. But when there are agents around, and where those agents might be lions or leopards or crocodiles who might be lurking in wait for you, or might be stalking you, then it's important for your survival to attribute agency to things and that may generalize even to places where there's no agency. And I've often used the example of uh, a rustling in the long grass, which could be the wind, is actually most likely to be the wind, but which could be a lion. And although the odds are that it's the wind, uh, your best bet is probably to assume that it's a lion. Because if you get the bet wrong, um, it, it, if, if you bet on it being the wind and your bet is wrong, that then that, that's, that's rather tragic. Um, so um, there may be a psychological predisposition to in, invent agencies, invent agents where there aren't any. And this then, this same psychological predisposition generalizes itself to wind gods and thunder gods and, and lightning gods and river gods and, and, and sea gods and things like that, which then become merged later on in cultural evolution into the gods, into the named gods like Thor and Zeus and Apollo and Yahweh. Well, why not teach the controversy? There are real controversies in science. They're interesting, and we should certainly teach them. Uh, it's a, a very important part of scientific education to understand that science is not a done deal, that scientists are constantly changing their minds as new evidence comes in. That's important. So let's, by all means, teach controversies that really are proper scientific controversies. But the controversy over so-called intelligent design versus evolution is just not a real controversy at all. I hope it's not pure wishful thinking to suggest that there is a new wave of reason sweeping across America, Britain, the whole of the Western world. One indication of this, perhaps, is a wave of best-selling books, which I'm happy to advertise. <laughs> And perhaps even more significant is the backlash. And I uh, invite you to count along. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. The flea illusion you will, of course, recognize from W.B. Yeats, but was there ever dog that praised his fleas? Hence the flea powder that just got rid of that. <laughs> and a nice little afterthought. You... <laughs> you may not have seen the British edition, but that's a, 
uh, a, a, that's a copy of the, of the cover design of the, of the British edition of The God Delusion. <laughs> the next chapter, The Ark of the Continents, is about the geographical distribution of animals and plant species in the islands and continents of the world, which, coming back to our detective analogy, are exactly what you would expect them to be if they had evolved, and exactly what you would not expect them to be if they had been created, especially if they had been uh, released from Noah's Ark. It is almost too ridiculous to mention it, but I'm afraid I have to because of the more than 40% of the American population who, as I lamented in chapter one, accept the Bible literally. Think what the geographical distribution of animals should look like if they'd all dispersed from Noah's Ark. Shouldn't there be some sort of law of decreasing species diversity as we move away from an epicenter, perhaps Mount Ararat? I don't need to tell you that, that is not what we see. Why would all those marsupials, ranging from tiny pouched mice through koalas and bilbies to giant kangaroos and diprotodonts, why would all those marsupials, but no placentals at all, have migrated en masse from Mount Ararat to Australia? <laughs> Which route did they take? And why did not a single member of their straggling caravan pause on the way and settle in <laughs> India, perhaps, or China, or some haven along the Great Silk Road? Why did the entire order Edentata, all 20 species of armadillo, including the extinct giant armadillo, all six species of sloth, including extinct giant sloths, and all four species of anteater, troop off unerringly for South America, <laughs> leaving not a rack behind, leaving no hide nor hair nor armor plate of settlers somewhere along the way? Why did all the penguins undertake the long waddle south <laughs> to the Antarctic? not a single one to the equally hospitable Arctic. Once again, I'm sorry to take a sledgehammer to so small and fragile a nut, <laughs> but I have to do so. I have to do so because more than 40% of the American people believe literally in the story of Noah's Ark. We should be able to ignore them and get on with our science, but we can't afford to because they control school boards. They homeschool their children to deprive them of access to proper science teachers. And they include many members of the United States Congress, some state governors, and even presidential and vice presidential candidates. They have the money and the power to build institutions, universities, even a museum where children ride life-size mechanical models of dinosaurs with saddles which they're solemnly told coexisted with humans. We can't afford to be snooty in Britain about that. 28% of the British population get their science from the Flintstones as well, believing that humans coexisted with dinosaurs. The novelist Douglas Adams, to whom The God Delusion is dedicated, picked out exactly what's going on here in a wonderful speech, an impromptu speech that he made in Cambridge uh, not long before he died, and I was privileged to be there. Fortunately, somebody had the blessed good sense to switch on a tape recorder, and so this priceless hour or so of Douglas just holding forth impromptu is preserved. And I'm going to read a, a passage from it, because he, he puts his finger exactly on what's going on with all this offence. Religion has certain ideas at the heart of it which we call sacred or holy or whatever. What it means is, here is an idea or a notion that you're not allowed to say anything bad about. You're just not. Why not? Because you're not. <laughs> if somebody votes for a party that you don't agree with, you're free to argue about it as much as you like. Everybody will have an argument, but nobody feels aggrieved by it. If somebody thinks taxes should go up or down, you're free to have an argument about it. But on the other hand, if somebody says, I mustn't move a light switch on a Saturday, you say, I respect that. <laughs> Why should it be that it's perfectly legitimate to support the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, Republicans or Democrats, this model of economics versus that, Macintosh instead of Windows? But to have an opinion about how the universe began, about who created the universe, no, that's holy. 
We are used to not challenging religious ideas, but it's very interesting how much of a furore Richard creates when he does it. Everybody gets absolutely frantic about it because you're not allowed to say these things. Yet when you look at it rationally, there is no reason why those ideas shouldn't be as open to debate as any other, except that we've agreed somehow between us that they shouldn't be. And that agreement seems to extend to the non-religious as well as the religious. Let's raise our consciousness. What's so special about religious arguments that they should be immune to exactly the same kind of rational discussion as political or any other kind of argument? OK, my final question to you is, is a bit of a challenge, really. Um, in The God Delusion, you consistently refer to two different possible explanations for various things, one being a crane, one being a sky hook. And I have to say that for me, those, those, that terminology doesn't work terribly okay. well. I find the two actually quite confusing. Okay. To me, a crane, if I imagine a building crane, it feels terribly like a sky yes, hook. Yes, that's me. a good point. Um... Okay, the, the terminology is not mine, it, it's Dan Dennett, the philo philosopher Daniel Dennett. And uh, what he means by a skyhook is an explanation which is sort of like a great hand coming out of the sky and fiddling with things. And you're left without an explanation for where this great hand comes from. So God is a skyhook, fairies are skyhooks, spells, incantations, um, wizards and witches and warlocks and, and, and turning frogs into princes, um, none of that has any kind of explanation. It's all, it's all done by skyhooks. And when a fairy tale allows you to wave, wave a magic wand and make things like that happen, that's a skyhook. God's a skyhook. Uh, OK, that's skyhooks. A crane is the opposite of a skyhook. A crane is an explanation which really does elevate. A crane really does explanatory work. Evolution by natural selection is the crane par excellence. Because evolution by natural selection starts with primordial simplicity and works up by slow and gradual, intelligible, understandable degrees to ever increasing levels of complexity until you reach levels of complexity that couldn't conceivably happen by luck. Skyhooks are a kind of um, inadequate rationalization of luck. A crane is a true explanation which really does work up gradually. And I think Paula's problem is that if you think about a crane, there is a, there's a hook hanging down, down from yes, the sky. Exactly. And so that, I think Dan Dennett's terminology from that point of view is, is unfortunate. So perhaps we should substitute, what do you think, uh, what are those things that farmers have that, that, that um, um, a forklift, no, a, a, um, um, an elevator that where you, where you toss hay onto a, a sort of moving ramp. An, an escalator, escalator yes. would be good. Escalator okay, we don't have skyhooks and cranes, we have skyhooks and escalators. Okay. And what we need is an escalator um, yes. and natural.